Okay, so I've told you a story about um, your dirty kitchen and I've set up the prisoner's dilemma and I've told you that it applies to a wide range of situations um, and it's a nice model, etc, etc. But maybe some of you have some doubts. So maybe you're asking, do people really play this way? Um, is this really how humans behave? Um, I don't know, so we have to find out. So in the end, I would, this is a theoretical model, so we need an empirical test of this. So let's do an experiment. And thankfully, a really, really, really strange British game, th game show from a few years ago provided exactly this. They made contestants play something that looks very much like a prisoner's dilemma. Are you ready for our experiment? Let's watch Golden Balls. This is serious, life-changing money. Your jackpot today is 100,000, 150,000. You have one final decision to make. Easy decision. We're now going to play Split or Steal. I know you're the last two people in the country I have to explain this to. But you have two final golden balls. You each have a golden ball with the word split written inside. You each have a golden ball with the word steal written inside. You will make a conscious choice of choosing the split or the steal ball. If you both choose the split ball, you split today's jackpot of £100,150 and you go home with £50,075. If one of you splits and one of you steals, whoever chooses the steel ball will go home with £100,150. And the person who chooses the split ball goes home with nothing. If you both choose the steel ball, you go home with nothing. OK. Before I ask you to choose, I want you to look at your two golden balls and make sure you know which is the split ball and which is the steel ball. This is very important. Make sure you don't show each other. Oh, you'll get to watch the rest in one second. First, let's make sure we're all on the same page about the uh, game and the payoffs. So both players, the man and the woman, face a choice to select either split or steal. Yeah. And the payoffs are as follows if you paid attention. So if both choose split, both go home with fifty thousand pounds. If the man chooses steal and the woman chooses split, he gets hundred thousand, she gets nothing. And if she chooses steal and he chooses split, she gets hundred thousand and he gets nothing. And if they both choose steal, both get nothing. Okay. This is not exactly a prisoner's dilemma for those of you who have uh, looked at the payoffs here um, because you're kind of indifferent between um, ending up in the defect defect equilibrium if you want and being the the sort of sucker but it is close enough for us to see uh, what happens so think a little bit about like what do you think is going to happen so who's going to split who's going to steal what's the game theory prediction well the game theory prediction is that both choose steal because if I think the other person is going to choose split, I'm better off stealing. And if I think the other person is going to choose steal, I'm indifferent between the two options. So let's see how real people play. Before I ask you to choose, I think you have some talking to do to each other. Stephen, I just thought they weren't puppy dog tears and they were real oh. tears and you were genuinely going to split that money. I am going to split this. I, I, I just... 50,000. I'm... I'm just... Un, it's unbelievable. I'm very, very happy to go on with 50,000. You were genuinely going to split... If I stole off you, every single person there would run over here and lynch me. There was no way I could... I mean, everyone who knew me would just be disgusted if I stole them. When, when people watch this, they're not going to believe it. Please. I can look you not. in the Sarah, I can look you straight in the eye and tell you I am going to split. I swear down to you, I am going to split. Okay. This is serious money. It is. Sarah, Steve, choose either the split or the steel ball now. Hold it up. 
We're going on with 50 grand each. I promise you that. Split or steal? You never know what's coming in this game. <laughs> Congratulations, Sarah. You have just won 100,150 pounds. <laughs> Stephen, I'm so sorry. Commiserations, you've lost. OK. So, an unfamiliar feeling for one of you, but a horribly familiar feeling for the other. This has been Golden Balls. Until next time, goodbye. Golden Ball has taught me that some people look for revenge quite easily, and greed obviously knows no bounds. When Steve revealed the split ball, I wasn't proud. I didn't feel happy about what I'd done, but having been stabbed in the back last time, I just couldn't put myself through it again. Wow. Was that what you expected? Maybe. If you think like an economist, it was. But I have some questions. First of all, did she feel happy when the big reveal happened, when, the, when she won? She had just won £100,000 at a game show. Look at her face. She didn't feel happy. She felt guilty. And later she said, I wasn't proud of choosing the steal option. Hmm. So clearly there's something more going on uh, than just winning this game. And this is in, a, in the confines of a game show where the goal is to win. Mm. So when we think about human interaction in prisoner's dilemma type situation or about cooperation more generally, we have to think about human emotions and maybe where those emotions come from. So let's think a bit more generally and a bit more systematically about solutions to the problem of cooperation. I think it makes sense to think about solutions to the problem of cooperation in four broad categories. Emotions, reciprocity, fairness, and external enforcement. And some of these explain each other and some are mutually reinforcing. So let's start with emotions. You saw what the lady looked like and what she felt like mm -hmm. uh, after she had, she had uh, won the game show. She felt guilty. She said later she wasn't proud of what she had done. And guilt is one powerful emotion that can motivate people not to do the wrong thing. But we can also think of sort of altruistic uh, action, you know, positive uh, acts that we engage in. We, in. we feel positive emotions if we do something nice for people, if we help other people. It makes us feel good about ourselves. And this is clearly hardwired. Uh, so it's very, we, we speak of people who do not experience these emotions as psychopaths or sociopaths, right? So it's clearly something that is hardwired for most of us. And we can think of this either as sort of an evolutionary story where this is a, this is behavior that has, has evolved out of our evolutionary background, or we can think of it perhaps as internalized norms. So I'm not going to wade into a uh, nature versus nurture debate here, but clearly there's something going on with most people. Okay. So we all experience pro-social emotions and try to do the right thing. Now, where do those come from? Why do people, people experience those emotions? That's a more fundamental question. It has to be good to do that. What do you mean by good? Well, by, for example, conveying an evolutionary advantage. And this is where the evolution of cooperation comes in. Robert Axelrod, the guy on the, on the top right, uh, wrote in 1984 a book, The Evolution of Cooperation, and basically uh, outlines a solution to the prisoner's dilemma. And the solution um, is based on reciprocity and on repeated interaction. Basically, what Axelrod found is that if you don't engage in just one shot interactions, but you engage with each other repeatedly, it often can pay to be good. And specifically, he found a strategy, which many of us have heard about, uh, that we call tit for tat. And this tit for tat strategy is basically reciprocity defined. So what is tit for tat? Well, tit for tat means that the first encounter, you play nice, you do the right thing, you cooperate. Yeah. Um, 
And every following round, you basically do what the other player did in the round before. So if the other person is also nice, you're nice back. And we are on this sort of positive reinforcement uh, um, spiral to, to, to friendship and cooperation, okay? You do something nice, I do something nice, cooperation is sustained. What if the other person cheats? If the other person cheats, you're not a fool. You must retaliate. So if the other person cheats, you cheat back. You treat them badly back. But importantly, you have to be forgiving. So one of the other features of the tit-for-tat strategy is that it forgives. So if the other person cheats on you, you strike back. But after that, you go back to being nice if the other person is being nice. So you can punish bad behavior, but you don't end up in sort of a, a defect, defect spiral where you whack each other over the head all the time, okay? And that's the deep insight of, the, um, of, of, of Robert Axelrod's contribution to, to the question of cooperation. And in the book, he tells a really interesting story. And the story is about soldiers in the First World War. So in a situation where clearly the goal is to fight each other, uh, the definition of a defect defect equilibrium, if you want, huh? where soldiers are opposed to each other, standing in trenches and shooting at each other to kill each other. But what did Robert Axelrod describe or find? Well, he found that in many cases on the front line, curious sort of norms emerged. And those norms were, for example, that you do not attack during dinner time. It's really inconvenient if you're eating your soup and the enemy is attacking and you have to throw away your soup and you have to fight. So what happened is that in some areas of the front line in the First World War, there was basically cease, mini ceasefires observed during lunch and dinner times. Uh, this was never agreed. There was no communication, of course. The German and the French or British soldiers on the other side didn't talk to each other. They, they would have been killed. But just by interacting repeatedly, they were able to establish a norm that during certain times of the day, you do not engage in, 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 in fighting. Mm -hmm. So even in a situation where all the incentives are against finding a cooperative solution, humans are actually able to cooperate and to find a solution to the problem they find themselves in and to you know, live in the circumstances and, and, and let live. You know? But the story doesn't have a happy ending, of course. This is the First World War, and the leaders or generals got wind of what was going on, and they stopped this. How did they do it? Well, it is easy. You just rotate the troops that, that face each other, and the new soldiers coming in didn't know that there's a you know, sort of mini lunchtime ceasefire every day, and so people killed each other uh, in the trenches. This is an example of direct reciprocity. There's one more form of reciprocity though, and that's what we call indirect reciprocity. And indirect reciprocity basically works via me observing how two other players treat each other. If I observe that another player is nice, I assume maybe the other player is nice and I want to cooperate with this person as well. And if I observe that the other people are behaving badly, maybe I don't want to cooperate with them. And we, of course, know this idea of indirect reciprocity under the more common term of reputation. And the people in the Golden Balls video make explicit reference to the idea of reputation. The man says, if I were to steal all my friends, what would they think about me or something along those lines? So pro-social emotions, direct reciprocity, indirect reciprocity, what other solutions to the problem of cooperation do we know about? Well, there's one that involves fairness. We all have an inbuilt sort of sense of what is right or wrong. At least that's what a lot of people believe. And to show this, we will watch an experiment with monkeys. 